Hello, and welcome back to Invent Anything. Today we'll cover the prior art of invention, a journey you should start packing for. In this episode, we're gonna deal with prior art, but not only from the perspective of how a patent office looks at it, but how it impacts you as an inventor or how it impacts you as a business. Today, we will cover the definition of prior art in topic number one and why we should talk about it. In topic number two, we'll talk about the methods of finding prior art and why you need expertise. In topic number three, we'll talk about prior art and the patent office. Topic number four, we'll talk about strategies for using prior art for leverage, little understood. Topic number five, we'll talk about the wonderful amalgam of prior art and inventing and how they work together. And finally, in topic number six, we'll talk about the future of prior art with some predictions you might find fascinating. And I chose this topic because there's so much more to prior art than how the patent office treats it and how you as an inventor need to overcome it. It really has a lot to do with business. So just knowing the legal definitions and all that is one thing, but we're gonna go far beyond that. And then of course, we'll wrap up. From the audience, we always sort of ask the question, what kind of people might be interested in the podcast? So I would say, if you're an inventor, this is definitely for you. Um, maybe you just got your first office action from the uh, examiner and uh, it was not good. This is definitely for you. Uh, maybe you're a manager of other inventors and you'd like to understand this subject of prior art because it comes up a lot. If you're an independent inventor, maybe you can learn how to leverage yourself using and winning the game over prior art. If you're in a corporation, uh, this will give you a 360 view of this term prior art, how it can be used for inventing. And finally, for those who have an interest in IP strategy, there are dozens of tactics we're going to describe here that you've never heard before. And I think that you'll really understand that prior art can be used with a lot of tactics. This is John Cronin, Invent Anything. And coming up, surprisingly, most of the inventors really don't know what prior art is and what it stands for, although it's critical to success. So stay tuned to understand it and also figure out how to find it quickly. Inventions keep the world spinning. From fire in the wheel to today's high tech, inventions power change. Turn your inventions into reality. Learn how to get your ideas to market. This is Invent Anything with John Cronin. So let's get into it. Topic number one, the definition of prior art and why we should even talk about it. First of all, any publication in any form, in principle, we qualifies as prior art. Often earlier patents or scientific publications are used because they're the easiest to find, but also things like textbooks, newspapers, lectures, demonstrations of, of exhibitions, etc. These are all proof of what could be called prior art. Something counts as prior art only if it's available to the public. That's important. So under NDA, it does not count. The date of the prior art must be provable because they need to go back to that date to determine when it was prior art, the examiner that is. In the US, when you sell or display something publicly, that counts as prior art unless it's under NDA. And as long as the inventor can prove that the disclosure of their invention was confidential, it doesn't count as prior art. Oral disclosures, such as lectures and things like non-confidential non discussions also uh, could be used as prior art. To determine whether something's prior or not, art or not, the filing date of the patent application or patent in question is crucial. If the publication or disclosure was made before the day of your filing, it counts as prior art. Internet publications are really a special case here. Of course, the internet is prior art uh, information on it, but as most patent offices perform searches of their own three patent offices, their own plus two other patent offices, they'll always do one other outside reference. And so they might look at the internet, they might not. Certainly we can use the Wayback Machine on the internet to go even further back than what you can see today. Another request, the requirement for prior art to qualify is that it must be enabling. We're gonna to touch on this, meaning that the prior art needs to teach how, not just what. So a journal article talking about what it is is not really considered prior art. It has to talk about how it works. One thing you should find out here is that there's a grace period of about one year in the US uh, where you could have your own prior art. You could be your own prior art, but you have up to a year to file a patent. Prior art needs to be something the examiner finds so that they can use it to stop others from filing patents and getting patents if there's prior art. You know, there are many types of searches for prior art. There's state-of-the-art searches, which is a list of patents under the state of the art 
There's patentability searches where a patent attorney or patent agent may actually look at your specific invention to try to find other patents right around your patent or, or invention. We talked before about freedom to operate studies in previous podcasts. That's a form of prior art. And there's also sort of a broad search called the landscape search, which is really understanding the prior art and the scope of a business. So you can see right there, there's four or five different ways to look at prior art from a broader view or a very narrow view. Let's jump into topic number two, the methods of finding prior art and why you need expertise. First of all, as I mentioned, the patent office internally has requirement that they need to search at least three other patent offices uh, over your patents. So they might be in the US, they might ser search the US patent office, the European patent office, maybe the Chinese patent office. But then they also have to cite one other reference outside of the patent office. And this is where they might go to the internet or some database that they may know of. It turns out that patent expert researchers are really best for searching the patents. Whereas a patent search done towards things like claims and titles and abstracts could be done, uh, whereby you don't have to be that much of an expert. There are searching the non-patent literature. So here you might use technical people to help you search. Now keep in mind that the references that you need to have prior art need to be teaching how things work, not just what it is. Sometimes expert searches will search internets uh, and all sorts of web links to try to find prior art. There is a company called IP.com where you can search uh, publications. Uh, I started this company in, a number of years ago. When I was at IBM, we had inventions that would be filed, but sometimes we'd file them as enabled publications. We have a podcast on that. So to search enabled publications, IP.com is a wonderful reference because they're all enabled and they're all searchable. Sometimes companies open up the prior art search to what's called a crowd. Uh, at one point in time, I bought a company called Article One Partners that we would have 135,000 people in the crowd and we could send out a prior art study to them. And somewhere in the world, there could be some expert that understood the, the, the request and could go find prior art. And maybe it was in their personal library. But see, in the, today, there are people using web crawlers to go find prior art, to go through hundreds and hundreds of thousands of references really quickly. And finally, I talk about there's really three types of searches. The first type of search is a keyword search. This is where you become expert by putting words in like, you know, bathtub near five legs. So the bathtub and legs might be near five words from each other. So there's particular keyword searching that can be done. The second type is to maybe throw a paragraph in about that bathtub with all these legs on it and let the computer read the paragraph, let the computer figure out, you know, what are the semantics that wants to pull out of that to search. And finally, there is now prior art searching that are done with AI agents like uh, I IBM's Watson and others. Uh, we work with some companies that are experimenting with the patent office to figure out what is the best AI to do patent literature search. Coming up, believe it or not, it's very normal to have your patents initially rejected by the patent office because of prior art. Once you get past this issue, you may be surprised how you can use that very same prior art to leverage your invention and your business. You're listening to Invent Anything with John Cronin. Be sure to visit us at inventanything.net. There's information, articles, and more. And you can leave your thoughts and comments there as well. That's inventanything.net. And now back to John and this episode. We're going to jump into topic number three, prior art in the patent office. Now I'm going to warn you, there's a couple of things that are pretty technical here, but they're very important. So when the patent office looks at your invention, and one of the first things it's going to do is look at the prior art. And if it finds prior art where it's before your invention, the examiner might set his prior art and offer a rejection to your invention. So there's different types of rejections. One of the ones I'll talk about, which is called a 102 rejection. This is where there's an exact match. It doesn't happen a lot, but the rejection states that they find one piece of prior art that discloses each and every element of your claimed invention. Now, this is important, right? Because prior art is against the claims of your patent that you're trying to get. So when they read your claims, they're going to try to find prior art that's the same uh, as your, your, your claim. It turns out that 37% of all the patents get a first rejection from the patent office. The next rejection is called a 103 rejection. And this is where the patent will mention must be non-obvious as an improvement over the art. And in this rejection, it means that the examiner considers your invention to be obvious. Now, we could do a whole series of podcasts on this word obvious. 
as it has to do with patents. But first of all, you might know that in 103 rejections, 66% of all the patents are initially rejected because of the 103. In other words, what the patent examiner is trying to say is they found one or two references that when combined together would say that it would be obvious that your invention uh, was within those two references or three references. So the prototypical example here is that you've invented A plus B. A is known in the prior art. B is known in the prior art. And upon looking at A and B, A might suggest B or B might suggest A. So if the answer is yes, then A plus B would be obvious to be over your invention. One of the things to responses to these office actions that the patent attorney or patent agent will help you with is that response to 103, I have different ways to respond back to the patent office. They found prior art, so what do you do? You could actually interview the examiner and try to talk with him about why you think it's different than the prior art they found. You might do an RCE, which is a request for continued examination, which then gives the, the, the inventor more time to, to serve further claim amendments, to start changing the claims so that you can literally maybe move your invention away from the prior art. Uh, you could do things like uh, you know, appeal to the examiner if they've rejected your uh, invention over the prior art. See, overcoming the prior art is, is, is much more likely if the specification has more embodiments. Uh, so you have a specification and you have your claims, but maybe the specification has more things in uh, the invention than, than you're claiming. So suppose you claim the temperature sensor to monitor the temperature in a casserole dish. And the prior art shows the temperature sensor was inside of a grill. And they say it's obvious. You know, it would have been far better if you had other sensors listed in the specification, like maybe you had pressure and temperature in the casserole dish. Then you could overcome this temperature sensor in a grill by claiming that you're really after the speed of cooking, where if you understand temperature and pressure together as two sensors, then you'd understand the speed of the cooking and therefore you'd be able to get that claim. So one of the things about the prior art to overcome it is to make sure that you have enough in your specification when you write up your patent so you can draw from that added specification. One of the things about prior art is you actually have a duty to disclose the known prior art. Uh, and this is to say that if you're studying the prior art and you're submitting an invention, you have a duty to disclose what you think is the most important prior art. Uh, there are really two strategies here that come out and there are different ends of the bookcase, if you will. One strategy is don't do a prior art uh, review at all and let the examiner find out the prior art. That's a strategy that's very valid and many patent attorneys do that. On the other hand, if you're gonna do prior art, you should do it well. Some companies and some inventors do a deep understanding of the prior art so they can ensure when they spend the money on the patent that they can get it. And prior art for any patent is easily seen as prior art when you see the references. So the examiner, when they reference prior art will quote, cite it on the patent. And that's really important because you can actually see the citations and who is, who is being used that stops you or you have to overcome that prior art. In September 16, 2012, there was a new regulation in the Patent Office, a new way of looking at patents called the IPR or Inter Partes Review. It was part of the American Events Act. And what this allowed you to do was you could take a look at a patent which was valid, resubmit it to the Patent Office and to see if they could find a 102 or 103 rejection and basically take your valid patent and basically make it invalidated. So that changed a lot about the patent business, but now there's a secondary review for prior art that the patent office has, and you should know about that. Prior art is certainly used all the time in patent litigation by the defendants, where they try to say that the patent review, the patent office's review of, of your patent wasn't thorough enough and that they found prior art that should have been validated. And prior, prior art to me, I have this kind of a metaphor that prior artists to patents like North is to South in a magnet. There is no way that you can discuss patents without discussing prior art. And when you're using prior art for patentability, they're so related to each other that they always come together. Let's jump into strat uh, topic number four, strategies for using prior art. Now, I could tell you that we have hundreds of strategies and tactics here. We're just gonna mention a few. So one of the strategies for using prior art is to use this company, IP.com, once again, because you can publish invention as prior art and be anonymous. So you can have an enabled publication and publish it, and that would be prior art. You can use prior art in your patents to have references cited. So when companies are trying to acquire you or acquire your patents, they'll see their name as a citation and recognize that you've cited their patents. So your patent might have something to do with their business. Another tactic is to hide prior art. Do you know in Finland, there's over 150 languages spoken? Some companies actually take their, their 
uh, prior art and publish it in Finland in one of these languages of which there's not more than 10,000 people that know the language. So it's very difficult to find the prior art by a third party. And But you can always resurface it if you want to because you know where it is. Another thing is to use prior art on top of competitors because what, when you're doing that, what you're doing is you're stopping them from growing their market. So if you invent and use that on top of competitors' patents, you're actually uh, using them using prior art to stop them from patenting. Of course, prior art is really tied up with uh, invention and there are incremental inventions. So sometimes when you have incremental inventions, you can publish those and that will stop improvement inventions. You can use a tactic we call the Pied Piper, which is to literally do publications to have your competitor follow you. There are publications in prior art that are used for vanity, that someone's claiming that they're sort of the, the one who invented this. And that's a wonderful way of using prior art to help you sort of become the thought leader. Sometimes you can publish non-enablement to essentially imply enablement. And here what you're doing is you're publishing something where somebody thinks it works and it may not, uh, but it might block a patent. One of the well-known strategies is the patent part and publish part uh, so you can get the protection that you want through the patents, but maybe stop others from improving uh, through publication. What we've talked about this before in strategy that maybe you want to poison around your well. So if you want fresh water in a well and you want to poison around your well, nobody else can uh, uh, drink water from other wells but because you poison the well, which makes your well the more important one. And then finally, you can publish prior art uh, so that your supplier uh, can't get patents. And this is really important because sometimes suppliers start to work with the company and they start patenting their solution. So creating prior art to stop your supplier uh, is a way of doing it. Coming up, let's see how prior art can affect the way you invent. Maybe prior art can improve your invention skills. And if you can survive and have your prior art uh, overcome the prior art, you might take a look at where prior art is headed. And I have some predictions that I'd like to share with you about where this whole era of prior art goes in the future. You're listening to Invent Anything with John Cronin. Be sure to visit us at inventanything.net. There's information, articles, and more. And you can leave your thoughts and comments there as well. That's inventanything.net. And now back to John and this episode. Topic number five, prior art and inventing. Since prior art and patents is like north and south of the magnet, well, you can't have north without south and vice versa. Prior art is usually the first thing you should do to evaluate before you proceed on inventing. Before you even start writing down your invention, you should sort of think about what's in the prior art. A lot of times you'll save yourself countless days and hours and sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars if you just spent the time on the prior art. And don't be afraid to call an expert and maybe spend a little bit of money to have them search the prior art because they're really good at it. However, there is something that we should talk about, which is I call the type one error on prior art. We know in the scientific methodology, right, that you don't prove your hypothesis, you actually prove the null hypothesis. And if you spend a lot of time trying to prove the null hypothesis and you can't uh, prove it, then with some degree of certainty, you can accept the hypothesis. And likewise, prior art's like that. Because if you look at the prior art and you think that from the prior art it's obvious, you've made a class one mistake, I believe because obviousness is a patentability term, it's a legal term. And if, you don't, if you're not a patent attorney or patent agent, there is no way you should be using the term obviousness to stop yourself from inventing. You need to get a professional opinion. I have seen countless inventors really get upset later on to find that their invention, which they said was obvious, was, was uh, filed by somebody else as a patent after them, uh, which gave them enormous leverage in the market. So don't do a type one error obviousness, get some help. One of the things about prior art is you can look at inventions and find the white space. That's a term we use. When there's no prior art in a certain area, that might be a white space to invent. So when you do a prior art search, you're trying to find out the prior art, but you're also at the same time trying to find the, you're actually finding the white space. And that makes you a better inventor. Another thing is that prior art is not absolute. There are really levels of overlap. I mean, there's always things that can be claimed over the prior art. So just like we talked about the casserole with the temperature, a sensor. They can also have a pressure sensor. There's always ways to overcome the prior art through improving invention and enabling uh, a different direction. When documenting inventions, keep in mind, as I mentioned, these many embodiments that you'd write up. 
so that if you find prior art through the patent office, you can get claims in maybe different directions to overcome those objections. I give an example here of, you know, maybe you have an automatic hazard sign that somehow will be popped out of the car if you're in an accident. Think about it, you're in an accident, you're on highway, and uh, while you're shuffling around and trying to do things, you wanna be protected, so the hazard sign automatically pops up. And you decide in, in this that maybe, you know, there ought to be an automatic call to 911, but by adding other embodiments, you may start brainstorming, well, geez, you know, maybe I could have an LED sign pop out, or maybe I can have something on the trunk open up that has a different color on it so that it flashes. By having different embodiments like that, uh, once you do the prior art and find out that all the new cars actually do call 911 when they're in an accident, you wouldn't be able to get that claim, but if you had those other embodiments, you certainly could. One of the things about prior art is it can point you to buyers or licensees. So if you find prior art, great news, you found potential customers. Uh, one of the things about prior art also is that if there's a lot of inventions around your invention that are just recent, uh, you now know that the market is kind of really close for timing. So one of the things about prior art is it tells you about market timing. On the other hand, if you find prior art that's so far away, uh, you know, the earliest prior art you can find is 10 years old then that shows that the market really didn't take off. And you might think again, whether you really want to file those inventions. Prior art by individuals is very different than prior art by large companies. You see, when you see a lot of prior art by individuals, I say it's kind of a risk to continue inventing because the market hasn't picked it up yet. On the other hand, if you find prior art by very large companies, that might tell you your invention is valuable because large companies play in big markets. Well, let's go to topic number six the future prior art and some predictions. I did a little bit digging and I found out that in a number of different references I found, human knowledge doubles every 13 months. That's amazing. And if you think about that, if it just doubles every year, basically, that's all prior art to next year, right? So one of the things is that we're gonna see in some predictions that AI tools can be used more and more by the patent offices. So when you submit your invention, there's gonna be an AI agent that's gonna go find the, the, the prior art and that's already happening. But we'll also think in another prediction that I'll make is that patents will become higher quality as time passes on because more and more prior art will be available. So the ones that will be allowed will be higher quality because they'll have a better prior art uh, review. We're gonna see prior art generated by AI itself. And we're gonna see probably a tenfold increase in all these uh, prior art strategies unfolding, meaning the AI can create prior art. Uh, prior art can be automatically extracted from CAD files. Uh, you could have a, a CAD design that basically takes a design and has 20 parameters and you decide on each parameter for your design, but you can let the computer run all the 20, 20 times 20 combinations and each one of those can be published as prior art from one design. So we're going to see one design maybe have millions of pieces of prior art. You know, one of the things about prior art is there's very likely to be some new ways to have the value of patents be rated through prior art. I mean, a few citations might mean that it's more novel where many citations may mean it's very incremental. So we can see new kind of rating systems based upon prior art and whether the prior art is helping us understand the value of an invention. One of the things that we find in another prediction here is it may be that computers will look at products and extract from them parameters, create some meta tags, and those meta tags can be then used to see if they overlap your claims. Because right now it's pretty difficult to take your claim and look at a product and say, does your claims read on that product or not? In other words, is that product prior art? Another thing we're gonna see here is that there could be all sorts of services popping up, which can take things like any, any kind of new web page or any kind of new audio or video and extract from that data like transcripts and then turn that into uh, meta tags that can be used as prior art searching. One of the things that we've worked on at IP Capital is to use prior art chasers that basically you have the computer look at prior art, but let the web run for another week or two by itself to essentially chase prior art in the web. And one of the final things I'll mention, and I've mentioned this, I believe in a few other podcasts, is that once we start marrying computers and AI to creating content, and that concept becomes a prior art, what that means is computers can generate more and more prior art much faster than human beings can which then means that it's gonna be even more difficult to patent if there's even more prior art. I mean, if humans can double their knowledge every 13 months, imagine what computers can do. And what that does is it starts to overall weaken the patent system because the more prior art and the less patents, 
that would mean that a lot of less uh, products and services would be patentable. So let's wrap up. In topic number one, we talked about the definition of prior art and why we should talk about it even. We discussed all sorts of prior arts from patents to lectures and what counts legally as prior art. And it, we also talked about it has to be enable, enabling. It has to be date provable. We discussed the critical timing of the prior art in the, in the one year grace period. We described all sorts of different ways to search for prior art from patentability to state of the art, free and awkward, et cetera. Then as we moved into method number two, ways of finding the prior art, why you need expertise, we discussed all sorts of different ways to find prior art, various types of experts. We, we, we talked about crowds and web crawls and all those things and talked about keyword searching and natural query language and AI and all those ways that you find prior art. I think one of the messages we take away from this is as you start to get into looking at the prior art, please go find expertise to help you. It'll save you a lot of time and money. Then we delved into the very specifics of the prior art and patent office. We addressed sort of the 102 rejection, which is the exact match, and the 103, which is this word obvious. And you recall that prior art is the patents, like North is the South of the Magnet, they always come together. Well, that's true here too, is the patent office can reject uh, your patent application on all sorts of issues, uh, like not being definite or, or written well, but prior art is one of the biggest ways that patents are rejected. In topic number four, as you recall, we talked about strategies for using prior art. We discussed 11 different tactics. We have hundreds of these. Things like being anonymous or hiding it, leveraging your patent, having vanity uh, prior art. We talked about poisoning the well around your own well, poisoning other wells to stop others. We even talked about using prior art to stop maybe suppliers from getting a patent position on you. You see, prior art is not just to stop you from getting a patent. It's a key tool for you to improve your own inventing capability, but it's also a great leverage tool in the tactics of IP. In topic number five, we talked about prior art and inventing. Here clearly is where I'd love to spend some more time and maybe another podcast, because I've known that prior art has made me a better inventor uh, with hundreds and hundreds of patents that I've had over time, always looking at the prior art was some, something I kind of worried about. Now, now I've begun to enjoy the journey uh, of prior art you know, that it helps me be a better inventor. We discussed ways to get into the trap of the type one error of obviousness. We even show that maybe you can use white space analysis while you're doing the prior art. Prior art can be used for market timing. Prior art can tell you how big the markets are. Prior art can actually tell you if your invention maybe even could be saleable. And then finally, we ended up on topic number six, the future of prior art with some predictions. Talk about human knowledge doubling every 13 months, but that then moves into that with more prior art, we're gonna have higher quality patents. There might be new patent rating systems that will come out. We'll have software that will enhance uh, the creation of prior art. Maybe there'll be automatic robots that take any kind of video or audio and transcribe it and extract out of it meta tags that can be used for prior art searching. So there'll be more prior art that is available, not just that's condensed in patents. Finally, we'll leave you with the idea that there could be prior art wars where AI meets prior art, creates lots of prior arts, and then makes it even more difficult to get patents. And then as you can't get more and more patents, mean, that would mean the less products could be protected. And so the patentability of, of many products would go away and that could lead and impact dramatically the GDP of knowledge-based countries. And remember, if you like this, please subscribe, give us a like, join our blog at Event Anything. And I hope you get to listen to our new series on Inventors at Work.